Thank you, Darren. Okay, um, so uh, Jonathan, are you online? Would you uh, start sharing? I'm here. Uh, yeah, I can share. And this is a collaborative document. You uh, go to the link and even you can start writing. Jonathan is in the queue. Do I need to do anything? I know. I know. It's all okay. I will stop sharing. Jonathan, are you requesting for control or something? Uh, I mean, I requested to share. Uh, not quite sure. Okay. How about now? Oh, I see. It's just asking me to share some slides, but I don't. Is there a way to just share my screen? At the yeah, at the bottom there are few icons, and um, yeah. number third is share screen. Okay, and now I requested to share screen. You got it. Got it. All right, here we go. And can the folks in the room confirm that the link on the Jabber uh, board works for you? Yeah, I got, I got the document. Okay. This one there. <laughs> That's the one. All right, can people see? Yes. If there's a useful format, I have it in the side by side right now, or should we just go to the just the edit mode? Let's just do the edit mode. Uh, it'll be bigger at least. All right. <laughs> yeah, up to you. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, that looks good. Great. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, so it looks like the chair is already copied in the at least uh, the context for each of the GitHub issues. Um, I don't. The first one is crossed off. I don't know if that was intentional. Uh, but this was yeah. about adding a state machine for Nat64. Into the document. So this is Ted. Um, I suspect that that's a bridge too far for this meeting. I mean, we could try, but um, that might not be the best one to start out on because I think we'll just spend the whole meeting on that. Okay. Sorry. That is fair, but uh, confirmation: is it part of the simple document or? Oh, yeah. So so uh, we had decided, I think. Um, probably two meetings ago, that we wanted to support NAT64 because we wanted to be able to allow internet connectivity when it's present. Um, and so that meant that we needed NAT64 and we also needed to support DHCPv6 in the simple document. So the non-simple, the thing, the difference between the simple document and the non-simple document has more to do with the way that the stub router integrates itself into infrastructure, which the simple document doesn't specify. So. That's so, so definitely NAT64 is, is in scope for simple. Okay. For this meeting, not for this document. Sorry. Yeah, I was just getting signed in while you were talking, so I might have missed a, some details there. If, if there was anything else I should capture. I think that's a good summary. So in order to address this one, I think we actually need to see the text. <laughs> for number two, you mean? Okay, so Second. 
So if you search for 521, you should find it further down in the document. There we go. If we speak, should we go to the mic to say something? Or <laughs> yeah, we'll have to. Yeah. Otherwise, Jonathan can't hear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just reading this comment uh, just now. Maybe I haven't seen it before, but I think this is the question about the. It says, "I assume stop routers are connected to the same uh, infrastructure link and the same stop network." Or maybe that was not clear. So are these two? So stop routers indeed for the same stop network and the same infrastructure link. In this case, it could also be a different stop networks, same infrastructure link, or it could be a same stop network, different infrastructure links. That's another case. And maybe that, that case, uh, I'm not sure, could be out of scope, the last one. Yeah, so I can't remember, I can't remember this, Ted. I can't remember if we, spec if we explicitly make multi-link multi-adjacent infrastructure link out of scope or not. Um, I'm going to just go look at the document when I sit down. But uh, the other thing is um, for single adjacent infrastructure link, I don't think it actually matters uh, whether the two stub routers are serving the same stub network because the point is that we're just advertising. Uh, and I, we have to have an IPv6 prefix on the adjacent infrastructure link. Some stub router has to do that. It doesn't matter what stub network it's serving. It just has to be some stub router doing it. Uh, and in fact, we see situations where indeed we do have two stub networks and it is possible for the stub routers to ping pong back and forth because of that. Um, and we, need, we just need text that says how to deal with that. And, um, uh, you know, I think the answer to this comment is that indeed, yes, the text should say that we have to remember the prefix as well as the time. <laughs> should we just leave the comment as is or actually write a paragraph? Darren, as a participant, it would I think it'd be awesome if someone could write the text or if we could take a crack at it. So are we group editing this? Uh, if so, I'd be happy to tweak the text. Might as well. We've got two hours and we want to produce some text at the end. Yeah, I'll, I'll. If you go to the Jabber room, a, chat room, chat. big too, <laughs> bit too far. No, 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 Zulip. <laughs> Zulip, yes, thanks. Seven forty eight. 
maybe there's a question in the meantime. So what is this time that, that the comment talks about? Remember the prefix and the time. Which time is that? Yeah, Darren is the one who wrote that. I'm reading the pair, the section now to try to remember where it is. <laughs> so, let me just point out that there are a couple of editorial comments at the end of this section that are probably worth looking at. Um, Jonathan, could you maybe scroll down a little bit? Yeah, so there you go. So uh, one of the things to say about this is that currently, the, so the thread implementation of this, um, we actually generate a prefix that we know is uh, going to be the same across all stub routers for a particular stub network, which does not prevent us from having two stub networks and still having the problem. But with a single stub network, we don't. And also with two stub networks, if you've got multiple stub routers per stub network, the likelihood of all of the stub routers that we're advertising the prefix for the same stub network going away is much lower. So we see this less often. Um, but uh, the point is um, that, uh, so the first point is we don't actually have to advertise the stale prefix. We can just configure it on link. And then um, if somebody remembers the prefix and remembers who sent it, which would be the stub router that sent it, then it's going to send it's going to send stuff to that using that source address um, to the stub router that previously advertised it, even though the advertisement isn't being sent anymore. So we don't actually need to continue sending the advertisement, which means we don't need to continue sort of polluting the, the routing table of all the devices on the network with stale data. Um, so that's one point. The other point is um, whenever possible, we should probably try to have all of the stub routers use the same prefix all the stub routers for a particular stub network if there is more than one. Um, and currently with thread, we do that by using a constant that's part of the thread network. So that's easy. For Wi-Fi, we don't really have a good answer for that. Uh, as it says up here, we could use something like the the, uh, the BSSID, I guess, is like a, a number, I think. So we could maybe use that as the prefix. But uh, so so if we're going to write some text, the question is, do people agree with that solution? Because if we if we agree that that's a good approach, then let's just update the text. If we think that's like particularly the SSID thing, like nobody here, as far as I know, has ever tried that. I don't actually know how well that's going to work, but in theory, it's not a bad solution. It's not a bad approach, and we have definitely had success with the XPAN ID approach. So can we write some text in here that captures both of those? One approach we could use would be to um, to just say. Uh, if possible, use an identifier that's specific to the stub network. And uh, we can leave it unspecified as to how to use it. Um, although we could also give examples like the XPAN ID. Um, and I think maybe that would be sufficient. Does that make sense? Yes. Does to me. Okay. Does right. to me. All right. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit the text to make both of these changes, if that's okay. All right. Yeah. Um, just as a process note, everything that we do in here will end up going to the list, of course. And so there's not a lot of risk of us taking some chances and mm -hmm. making some mistakes. Did you want to come? Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, Judith Krobacek. I'm a little worried that we're assuming that the SSID is unique. They are not. I enjoy putting the same SSID on multiple routers. Okay, that's big thing. Yeah. Well, okay. Now, uh, just to be interesting, okay. to, yeah, to slightly clarify, the concern is actually more that it's it's not that the SSID would be different per router, but that the same SSID might actually apply to multiple VLANs. And I don't know if that's actually ever, if that actually ever happens. If it does, we probably don't want to use the SSID. Yeah, it's not random enough, basically. <laughs> I know many network where the same SSID is in different buildings, different VLANs. Sure, but in that case, 
it's not really the same issue, right? Yeah, the stub network's not going to be in both, both of those buildings. It would be great to start routing. So. Yeah, but why not using the BSSID? They are using so the, the MAC address from the, uh, the AP. Should be mostly. It's, it's not better. No? Okay. Um, Michael Richardson. Um, Julian. Um, Julius, um, so you put the same SSID in multiple routers that are not connected together and have different subnets and different addresses. That's just wrong. No, it's just wrong because your, your laptops will come back and do the wrong thing. So you're actually make, you're make, making yourself a hassle. If it's the same SSID, it should be the same network. And if it's not, you're just confusing your users, right? That's all I'm saying, okay? So I think, but it's also okay if you're... Um, uh, AIL is different, right? Because you wouldn't have routing to the same field right. routing. As long as AIL is different, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So if they're sufficiently far away that you have different addressing and different things, then your pathology of doing that is unfortunate for your your users, but it's not going to kill anybody. Right, but presumably it goes through some other hash in this and whatever and produces the same answer. Otherwise, what would be the point? Julius Krobacek, MCR is probably right. It's probably a bad thing that I'm doing that, but there's no way you can prevent me from doing it. And therefore, a spec that assumes that I don't do it is going to break in some cases. No, there are no cases that it's going to break that are not already broken. You broke it. So just just to just to get that on the mic, there are no cases. Say that again. There are no cases that are going to break that aren't already broken. Is that correct, Michael? That's what I'm saying. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's this aspect also that the the, the prefix may be uh, the same prefix, maybe even reused in different places. But that you can also have that when you generate random prefixes, of course, uh, and it doesn't. Uh, break things as Michael said, uh, typically, so, yeah. Lorenzo. Uh, Lorenzo Clary, I missed most of this discussion, I think, but I, th I saw some text on the screen earlier that says, oh, the host will prefer the prefix that was most recently announced. I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the host will do probably the most stupid thing in general, so I don't know that we can rely on it doing that. I mean, it might, it might, who knows what it'll do. We can't rely on it, but it will depressingly often. So yeah, I don't know that we, I don't know if the scheme is relying on it though. Sorry, John Linkova, and I'm not even in the queue. Uh, I actually, actually, well, I don't think it's this case, right? But in my network, I have a case of same SSID, different subnets. But from my experience, if you use, if a route de de endpoint supports rule 5.5 of default address selection, and your link local address is different, then it works. If you have same link local address, you're going to have a problem. So the combination of unique link local ID plus 5.5 support on the host solve all those like broken things, which are broken currently. So like I, I have like experimental data on this, but I'm not sure how much it's applicable for what we're talking about here. But, and I don't think hosts are preferring the most recent prefix. I did have a draft long time ago about that because it wasn't the case, but it was never published. So, so I guess what Jen was saying is that you can make this work, but like if you come back and lose state and reboot, you might want to pick a new link local address uh, because then, you know, the, the, if you have like, you know, devices on the network have to have state from the previous link local address as the, as, as, as the gateway to the stub prefix, um, they will basically time that out using NUD. And then the, the new, the new advertisement will have the new link local address and, uh, hosts that support rule 5.5 will prefer that. Yes, thank you, Lorenzo, for translating me. Yes, and we actually have 
I have, there is a draft in V6 Ops talking about like that behavior, but you're basically trying to suggest and using different link local based on the prefixes you have. So um, Ted, again, uh, can we get some text to uh, capture this point? Because I didn't entirely follow it because I was typing some other text. <laughs> Yeah, so we, uh, um, Lorenzo and and uh, and Jen, you you can get onto the document and add text yourselves. So as that editing is going on, um, we had discussed uh, kind of a. 10 ish minutes per issue. We thought we might be able to get through a good number at that rate. Uh, we'd produce something uh, and move on to the next one. Um, I think we're, we, you know, we've gotten warmed up with a first issue. We've got a couple of editors uh, furiously typing away, maybe three of them or two of them at the same time. So maybe we'll give this one another four minutes and then we'll go to the next. Yeah. So once again, the link's in Zulip, and it's also in the room chat. Maybe just a quick comment what I saw you typing, Ted. So you say it uh, conforms to the RFC 4193. So I think the, um, the idea of the random uh, ULAP prefix is also that it's the same for the entire site. So if, if you have uh, different threat networks at one site, they will still pick different ULAs randomly. So that's yeah. kind, of, kind of not conforming, you could say. But yeah, <laughs> we can get away with it. It's okay. I mean, if one one threat network is just... The whole point of the ULA generation model is that it means that... The whole point of the ULA prefix generation model is that it avoids collisions when you have two ULA prefixes that previously were at different sites and suddenly are at the same site yeah. because the site merged. So that's why we do the random generation. Yeah, so yeah, I think it works in the purpose. Well, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, I don't see any problems, but uh, it looks rather strong and uh, like conforms <laughs> well uh, enough, it, maybe. It conforms to the, to the algorithm. Yeah. <laughs>
do we watch Jen type or do we move to the next issue? Uh, no pressure. <laughs> well, we were watching Jen type, although she deleted everything. So. <laughs> Fair. All right. So, so would you be okay with us moving on to the next issue while you? Great. Okay. Jonathan, let's move up to number three. Yep. Number three. I just want to congratulate the working group for getting one issue somewhat done. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, <laughs> and especially willing to collaborate this way, you know, I, we can see it's hard that you have to go back and forth. It seems like a bit slow, but we will make progress. It's actually kind of cool. The, when I do this kind of editing by myself, I don't get any of this feedback. The feedback slows me down, but it actually, in a sense, speeds up the process. Yep. Yep. So I'm not complaining. You know, I'll let Jonathan complain if he wishes to. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that applies to everyone in the room. This is more forward progress than we've made in the past six months, I think, or more. So, so we're on issue three. Three, yeah. Three. Oh, sorry. So, add restriction that the usable prefix must be. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think this was about the need single prefix that's used for the um, infrastructure link side and also for the stop network side. Yep. And I think what, what we've just been typing uh, goes against that requirement. So the idea was to relax the requirement or get rid of that requirement. Ah, great. Okay. Right. Okay, so, uh... I think, Esco, this is related to the most recent GitHub issue that you posted um, related to uh, prefix delegation, but it's the same thing. It's requirements to have six, uh, basically a slash 64. Yeah, this was also to clarify what, what does a usable uh, prefix mean. Uh, so you could say if it, there's a slash 70, uh, it's, it's usable. But I think the idea was that we need a slash 64. And the reason for that is probably in that RFC that, that is mentioned there. So yeah. that if anyone is advertising uh, already a slash 70, for example, or a slash 62, that it's not uh, yeah, not going to be usable uh, for devices to to do Slack uh, with. So I think that's the because that requires a slash sixty four. Uh, so I think that was okay. just to clarify that that you need uh, yeah usable means also that you have to check for the prefix length uh, being sixty four. I still think you're talking about this RFC ESCO seven four two one that we should reference. Yeah, so so I think it. Uh, there's maybe multiple RFCs that say this, but <laughs> it's good to have a reference uh, somewhere that says, okay, uh, this is why. Uh, Require 64. Uh, see, see that RFC. 
not sure, not sure if this is the right one here, but <laughs> I don't remember. But yeah, I think it would be good to have a reference here and uh, we can take that one and, and maybe if you find a better one later then update it. This one says, um, search for the words outside the IPv6 specifications, or it says basically anything on, yeah, there. So it's basically saying, well, we don't know if it's going to work. And I, it, that's what it says, right? It says, well, results may vary. It's like, well, we don't know what's going to happen. So I think uh, saying that something that's outside the current specifications is not usable seems like a reasonable thing to say. I can't remember RFC numbers, but 464 X slot requires slash 64 currently. No, 464 X slot, right? If you want to do V6 only. What's the section number for that section? Can you one. scroll up to the beginning of the section? Is section one? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's probably also some text. There's tech. We can find text somewhere that says Slack only works with the 64. I can't remember exactly where to find that text, but maybe you have to cobble together two bits. Uh, but I think if this might be enough. OK, so I think we've I, I've updated the text. Uh, what I've added to the text is pretty simple. I just added. Uh, so the first paragraph of usable on-link prefixes, section 511, talks about all the qualities that a usable on-link prefix must have. And I just added to that text that it has to have a width of 64 bits. And then I added a reference, RFC 7421, section 1. Uh, so that's something I mentioned at the last meeting. I'm bothered with the terminology. I would like to see a wholesale replacement of usable with something that is a little bit less biased. OK, so here there is this implication that if it's not slash 64, I agree with the technical content that says that if it's not slash 64, you do so and so. But I, what bothers me is this notion that if it's not slash 64, it's unusable and therefore wrong. I think there is a bias implied in the terminology here. Darren, would you like to suggest something better uh, then? I was thinking about something like overriding. Because what happens here is that if you have a slash 64, it doesn't over, you are allowed to override it. So uh, I, it's not a good term, but the idea would be to call it something like o an overriding. Hmm. Yeah, so. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm frustrated that the term usable feels like it's pejorative here. I just mean that it's a prefix that we can use. Um, there may be other prefixes that are advertised that we can't use. There's nothing wrong with those prefixes except that we can't use them. Um, so I could add some text clarifying that there's no intention that the term usable here be pejorative, but... Uh, I like that. Suitable. 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 All right. Suitable. Suitable it is. Yeah, I think it's about the same, right? <laughs> usable or suitable. So, or usable for the use case, yeah. You could have another term such as snacky or something, but I'm not sure that's <laughs> snackable. Snackable, yeah. Snackable. So, I was saying snackable would be explicitly describing what we want, but I, that's not really a word either. This is Darren. There's another, just a, another option uh, is perhaps to find usable prefix with some text around what the intention of that statement is. And we can smith that description. That sounds good to me if that's agreeable to 
Julius. Hmm? Well, so we don't like usable, we don't like suitable. So we just, I'm going to repeat on the mic what was heard in the room. There's a little bit of discussion around suitable, usable, and a uh, statement by Eric saying, well, if we simply define it in terminology, then it can be whatever we define it to be. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any other points on that, come on up to the mic and say them. Julius Krabacek, sorry I'm not in the queue, I got confused with my phone. Uh, I'd just like to point out that all the suggestions were made by non-native speakers. And that the hey. native speakers... <laughs> hey. I, I would recommend one thing. Everybody who is participating in discussion, put yourself in the queue. So for the recording purposes, people know who were discussing these items. So you don't have to come out of the queue, just stay in the queue. Refresh it. Okay, time is up for this issue. Should we go another five minutes? Or, no. we, get editing and then, uh, okay. or we can ask. Yep, go ahead. Uh, while we are editing this, should we jump to the next issue? So, Esco, you're okay if we just define usable prefix in terminology section. Will that work? Cool. So, where do we cite? Yes, as long as we define that, uh, define it properly in terminology section, that works. Darren, as an individual, that sounds like it's something that could be clarified on the list once we post this. Uh, if anyone has more comments, they can add them. I'm sure they will. Jonathan, number yep. three? Or number four, I think. I think that was number three. Uh, yeah, so we did number three. Number four, I relaxed the requirement on a single root ULA prefix generated by a stub router. So five, yeah, 522 says it must allocate a single ULA prefix for use of providing unlinked prefixes. And email discussion conclusion, I think, says to move that to a should. Yeah, maybe just uh, let me cl clarify that. So I think there was um, email discussion. The initial worry was that if you have two different prefixes, so the stub router picks a different one for the infrastructure link than for the stub network, then uh, routing would stop working. That was kind of the, the worry. And we had a long discussion on the list and it turns out that, okay, no, it's actually uh, okay in terms of routing. Uh, I think there was this was this thing with um, possibly with 
but that's another issue by the way but the type a and type b hosts that do not look at router advertisements in detail just send it to the default router but yeah that that gives other problems anyway so uh, <laughs> i think we didn't find any reason uh, yeah why you should have or you why you must have a single prefix so uh, I think with the thing we talked about with Wi-Fi networks and threat networks, so you get a random number from that and apply that to the uh, infrastructure link prefix. If you do that, then it will anyway be a different prefix than the one on the stop network typically. Well, it can be the same, but it can also be different, I think. So uh, that, yeah, that means that's no, no requirement anymore to must have the same prefix. Five two two. Jonathan, here, you scroll yeah. up. Sorry, I, I wasn't. You, know, you want me yeah, to? Yeah, the question was uh, what? Yeah, that's right. He wasn't on the mic. So the yeah, which section was this in? Five I think two it was two. Five two two. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Here we go. Yes. First paragraph. Yeah, I guess the question for me is, do we even need to say anything about having the same prefix? Like, just completely remove any discussion about it. So um, this is a really interesting question. I mean, the, the, the reason for this text is that um, we need to, so, so we, we already talked about what the onlink or the, the adjacent infrastructure link prefix would look like. And we've, we're already saying that it can be different because it could be based on uh, something like an XPAN ID. Uh, so obviously this text is wrong because of that. Um, separately, um, obviously it would be best, I think, if all of the stub routers that um, might advertise a prefix on the stub network could converge on a single prefix. Um, we don't currently require that. Um, currently, we just assume that every every stub router will allocate a prefix that will uh, potentially be advertised on the stub network. But if that stub router goes away, then some other stub router might advertise a different prefix on the stub network. So um, so the reason for this text is just to uh, to talk about the fact that stub routers have to have to allocate a prefix that they can advertise on this on the on the stub network so we could change this so that it um oh and the other thing is uh previously the assumption was that the stub router would use this prefix for both the ail and the um stub network and the stub network is sort of constant except that a stub network can partition and in that case you need to use a different prefix um, on the different partitions of the stub network. Um, and so the problem with not having this text for that particular case is that when a partition like that happens, we're going to wind up with the same prefix on both partitions. And if we have the same prefix on both partitions, then two different stub routers are going to be advertising reachability to that prefix, but they're actually advertising reachability to what are effectively two different links. So we can't use the same prefix in that case. And the advantage of having each stub router have its own prefix is essentially that uh, when this partitioning event occurs, um, we, uh, we are able to successfully number both networks and provide routing to both networks. Because by definition, each stub router will be connected to one or the other of these, these uh, partitions. So that's why we have this text here. Whether that's the right solution is another question. but. Maybe that explains what this is for. Um, we don't have the AIL problem anymore because of, you yeah. know. Um, and then, you know, I, I mean, historically, like the reason this was there, I mean, if we have a Wi Fi network that's kind of just a broadcast network, I don't think we really have the problem that I just described. And I think that with uh, Thread, we less have the problem now than we used to. Um, but we could also just loosen this text up so that it allows us to continue doing what we do on thread, but doesn't force the Wi-Fi use case to also do this. 
because I think in the Wi-Fi use case, it would be probably better to just agree on a single prefix that gets advertised on that particular stub network and not change it over time. Yeah, maybe just add to here. Yeah, Wi-Fi is, um, as is normally used, at least not a mesh network, so you don't get this partitioning problem, for example. So they might have different allocation uh, policies for that reason. Yeah, maybe one other reason uh, why, the, why the must was there is maybe to yeah, um, be ahead of uh, potential uh, reviewers later on that are pointing to RFC 4193 because there, there the idea is, well, you have a site and that gets allocated one ULA prefix randomly generated. So now you have a single device that, that is kind of creating two sites. So one, one site is the stub network and the other site is the infrastructure link. So the, that's kind of stretching the concept of a site a bit. So uh, maybe that was another reason. <laughs> so I just want to point out that, that we are kind of moving away from that, that policy. And it seems OK, but uh, it's just someone with that RFC in hand might say, oh, no, you're, you're not doing the ULA procedure correctly because you're not generating one random number uh, <laughs> for the site ID. But you were generating two, and that's that's not uh, as intended. But yeah, I don't know. Given that we're kind of, sorry, that we're kind of um, I mean, there there are other use cases for ULA, but I think this use case of ULA is probably one of the most uh, widely used use cases of ULA at present. <laughs> um, I suppose we're a little bit of a bull in a china shop here, but I think that what we're doing is 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 okay. I mean, I think we're following the spirit of the spec. Um, and as I said earlier, the spec doesn't actually define what a site is. So, Michael Richardson. Um, so, um, if we were to go all the way to one direction and every stub router created its own ULA for the stub network, um, and sometimes they were partitioned, but let's say they were not partitioned at that this point. The stub net, the the stub network. Then Ted, if I'm then the the network, whether it's thread or something else, uh, would have to cope with the fact that it now has uh, multiple addresses being advertised on it with multiple upstreams, multiple default routes, right from the two or more Sorry. stub routers. Because every stub router generated its own prefix for the stub network. Okay. Right? But only one gets advertised. Why? Specify that. But so they were partitioned when they started advertising. Okay. And then they unpartitioned. Right. At which point one of them gets withdrawn. One of them gets withdrawn. Okay. So on that side we can coordinate. Right. Okay. So what I, well, the reason I, that's why I was I was throwing this up because I'm like okay wait a minute what is it we're trying to deal with because when the stub network is partitioned it's appropriate we have more than one route when the stub network is not partitioned we are going to discover on the stub network that it's not partitioned and everything's going to be fine and something will get withdrawn now that may mean that address changes over time as different ones get withdrawn. The stub network is a Wi-Fi network. Ted, on the mic, please. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so so in the case that the stub network is a Wi-Fi network, um, then the the RA behavior that we were just talking about in 521 is also going to be required on the stub network so that we don't screw up the routing there. Because you might have a device on the stub network that remembers a prefix that was advertised by a router which has subsequently withdrawn it. We still want that prefix to work for that device. And so we we have to um, we have to what we have to we have to poison that that prefix. No. The, the, so the, the text the text in five two one now says even when we're not advertising that prefix, we still route for it and we still we still have it configured on the stub network interface so that so that if we happen to get a packet, you know, coming from upstream that's addressed to that prefix, we know that it's on link on the stub network. Right. OK, good. I, I'm, I'm happy. I just the reason I stood up was that it seemed like we should just figure out what happens when we don't do the do this and 
if that's the right answer, then we just always don't do it. But you're reminding me that what's happening. Okay, thank you. Eric Vink, <clears throat> just two suggestions for the first paragraph at the pointer where we talk about partition and unpartition to get some explanation on why is it so. And on the second one, um, you use should, but every should in, RF, in RSC must have an unless part, right? Where you don't do the should. Don't forget about doing this. Uh, Tim Chan, does the last sentence of 522 mean that as a stub router moves between different networks, it's going to renumber the devices that are attached through it? Um, isn't the benefit of ULA that you have stable addressing in your local network? So it's, it's going to be quite nasty. Okay. <laughs> yes, so, so it, it's actually saying may wish for privacy reasons. I, I think um, the problem is in general that, that all the things that were normally supposed to be stable, like your link local interface address and uh, yeah, IID for global address, that now it's being changed to, uh, for privacy reasons, it's going more towards, oh, let's change it every few minutes or <laughs> if this happens or that happens. So well, I think it's, the question is, what's the right it's more of, a, yeah, it's more of a general, uh, problem you could say yeah so it's not uh, all the things that used to be stable are not not stable anymore for these privacy reasons uh, I think the problem is maybe uh, it talks about about the single ULA prefix the last sentence here but well we just agreed we don't have a single ULA prefix anymore we have uh, one for the infrastructure link and we have one for the stub networks and and if you have like thread, uh, the one for the infrastructure link, if it's based on uh, on a thread random ID, then that will not change basically. So even if you hopped to different links with your stub router, then it means it will still advertise the same uh, prefix basically on that link. It might, yeah, it might still uh, change the prefix for the stub stub network and all the devices on it, but. Uh, so I think the last sentence is now kind of a bit dangling. So it doesn't say about which prefix are we talking about. So the one for the stop network or the one for the, are we yeah. saying it's AIL? So, so, <laughs> <A -I -L. laughs> yeah, so, so I was thinking about that. I, this section was originally talking about both, but I think maybe we just have this section specifically talk about the stub network. And then we'll have a separate section that specifically talks about addressability on the AIL. So, um, so I'll just interject while Tim's coming up to the mic that, that we already kind of agreed that the AIL side is actually not covered by this anymore. So, okay. yeah. But yeah, I mean, the privacy there, since it's ULA and it's constrained, is privacy locally is not being tracked when you're going to internet sites. But you could still be, it's just like harvesting MAC addresses and it's that kind of privacy also. I, so, so we we never need more than one AAL prefix, right? That right. One. Yeah, the AAL we're assuming is stable because it's not being sort of created ad hoc like these crazy stub networks. <laughs> well, but okay, so that text needs the, the text that's highlighted needs to change then, right? Right. Yeah, I think it's been deleted. Well, so I mean, the 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 uplink might not be stable, but um, if it's not, then um, like so, the, the, essentially, it's 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 stable by definition, I guess, is the way I would put it. The stub router model assumes that it's stable. Um, I think if we wanted to to make it possible to not assume that it's stable, we would need to really think about that. And currently, we haven't done any thinking about that. So, does, do we say what the AL prefix should be when there are multiple stubs? So uh, we do, in fact, have text that describes how that's done. What's going to happen is if there are multiple stub networks, then uh, we do a, a numeric comparison between the two prefixes, and we pick the one that I believe is numerically lower. 
Um, if there's three, then we, the, the very lowest one wins. Okay, so um, this text definitely needs to be deleted then. I think so. Oh, we have to, oh, we, we, we should delete the, for use in providing on link prefixes. Sorry, we basically should delete the infrastructure network here. Right. Yeah, so, so well, I mean, there is a slight complication there, which is that um, the- so, ev so every stub router must allocate a prefix for its own Right, because we, we want we want each stub router to be able to advertise a prefix that doesn't conflict with some other prefix. Right, for its own addresses, for the stub. No, no. So it's it's this is it's doing a public service, you might say. But um, some stub router has to do that public service. It doesn't always have to be the same stub router, but um, but the service is required, and so um, so. Right, unless if the home router is doing it, we don't have to do anything. We just we just use the home router prefix. We're like we're we're totally agnostic. Like we would much prefer that infrastructure provide that prefix because it's going to do a better job by definition. Um, but supposing that infrastructure doesn't do that job, in the case of thread, well, we actually have. What a, if it's a global prefix and can get renumbered or deleted by the ISP? Yeah. I don't. Yeah. yeah it's unstable for that reason. Yeah. yeah, but but we're we're assuming that the that the that the RFC seven eighty four is being seventy eighty four is being followed, right? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so if 7084 is being followed, well, no, 7084 actually requires that the router, that the, that the home router provide a stable ULA prefix. Mm. So that means that we can assume a stable prefix if the router is IPv6 capable. And in fact, a lot of uh, home routers, even if, yeah, I know, right? Uh, a lot of home routers, even if, uh, even if they are on an IPv4 only network, will still provide a ULA prefix on the on the on the land side, and so we just don't have to do anything. Yeah, well, I shouldn't say a lot. Yeah. OpenWRT does that by default. Yeah. I've seen it a lot. That's a that's an interesting implication for Tim's sixty seven twenty four drive. Actually, uh, I guess this text we just need to like substantially separate between this text, the you know assigning addresses for the stub, or providing addresses to the stub to you know like providing addresses on the AL because the AL could be. It could be the infrastructure router. It could be one of the stubs with the, with the one with the lowest number. But I think this is right. this text just needs to be split in two. Then. Well, I mean, the point of this text was just to say that you have to have a prefix that you can use for these use cases, and and it's it should be different in the way that you get a different prefix is by generating ULA following the RFC. Julius, can you check that brings us back a little bit to the discussions we had with Michael earlier. I mean, this is the home. Any misconfiguration that you can imagine will happen in the home. And what you're, we are trying to do here is to build a device that you can plug into existing home networks, saying that the home network doesn't comply with an RXE, saying that there is an SSID collision, saying that the AIL is not stable, is not acceptable in the home. Now, this doesn't mean that we need to explicitly take those cases into account, but it means that even those that home networks are going to be misconfigured statistically that's inevitable and we need to make sure that things don't go horribly wrong in the case where the AIL is not stable where there are ssid collisions and so on because right. in the home network any possible misconfiguration is going to happen that's inevitable. well so I, I agree with your principle but i don't agree with all of your conclusions um the first conclusion that i don't agree with is the one about the ssid i think the ssid in a home network um, is unlikely to have properties that would conflict with the use that we've talked about for it, although we're not requiring that use. Um, and the reason I say that is because people just don't set up multi-subnet home networks. That's a very unusual thing. And the person who does set up a multi-subnet home network is either an expert or they're using a stub router. If they're using a stub router. We've defined stub routers as not providing um, routing, so not providing transit. So. Uh, so we're explicitly excluding that particular situation. Now, it's possible the stub router could, through stupidity, advertise an SSID that is the same as the home router SSID, and that would cause massive problems. So we definitely don't want that. We don't currently actually say anything about what SSID to advertise on a stub on a stub net network if there is a stub network. Um, uh, sorry, if the stub network's Wi-Fi. So that's that's a problem that we might want to think about whether we need to say something there. Um, that hadn't even occurred to me until you brought it up. So thank you for that. Um, the other thing is that um, we, so 
we have some experience with this, right? Like this is, you know, this is not, I know this sounds like it's new technology that we're developing and, and, and it may well be that we actually change this substantially. And so it winds up looking like new technology because we don't actually want to go the same route that, that our prototype went. But we do have prototypes that are actually being sold and used and working in the field. And so we have some experience with the problems that you're talking about. And uh, there are a couple of things to say about that. One is that for the most part, cheap home routers are fine. Um, we never see issues with cheap home routers. We never see issues with like, um, you know, something that's, that's like a, when I say cheap, I, that's actually also somewhat pejorative because sometimes they're not cheap. Sometimes they're actually quite expensive and high quality. But, but what I mean by cheap oh, is sorry, that they're not- The term is PHR, plastic home router. The well, so, so, so the distinction that I think I should be making is the distinction between consumer and prosumer, right? So consumer routers, generally speaking, don't have issues. There are exceptions. For example, we've seen some home routers that advertise, uh, like you can do, they, they, they support DHCPv6 PD, but if you ask for a prefix, they give you the same one that's on the link. <laughs> uh, so I actually have code in our implementation that ch compares the prefix that's on the AIL with the prefix that, that we were given with PD. And if we get uh, the, the same prefix with PD, we just chuck it. Um, and we, we mark that link is not supporting PD. Um, so, so we do have issues like that. Um, but, you know, part of the, part of our strategy and one of the, one of the fortunate, the uh, somewhat fortunate situation that at least Stuart and I are in, and I think the Google folks are in too, is that people will listen to us because we work for Apple. So if somebody has a buggy router, we're going to A, hear about it because we, we get a bug report and B, we know who made it and we can talk to them and ask them to fix their bug. And so this is actually really good. And so there's, there's, to some extent, we don't want to just like assume that things will be broken and deal with the brokenness. What we actually want is that if things are broken for us to find out and get it fixed, because ultimately our goal here, at least Apple's goal is not this, but certainly my goal here is to, is to uh, facilitate the, the spread of, of the IPv6 virus. And uh, <laughs> this is one way of doing that, right? There are many more networks that are actually using IPv6 for an IPv6, for an application that only IPv6 can do now than there were, you know, before we started shipping this stuff. So um, this is not to say that your objection is wrong. It's just that we need to be careful about how we think about it. And it's not always the right answer that we should just work around the brokenness. Fair enough. Okay, so we've uh, gone over our 15 minute plan for this issue. Well, it's a great conversation. And I think I think there's some good text that is going to come out of this. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I'm observing here is that um, it's actually, this is something that I hadn't really thought about and you, you remarked on it earlier, is that it's actually kind of hard to listen to the conversation, participate in it and make text changes. So to some extent, we may need to have moments of silence or I may just need to take notes for future changes, one of the two. Okay. Um, so why don't we take a few minutes and you can take a crack at turning into text what you've just experienced. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, you can, only lightly. If, only if it's in three-part harmony. Not four-part, not two-part. <laughs> IETF dad jokes. <laughs> All right. Shut up now and type. When I updated this section's title to say on stuff network, do we, does that make sense? I, I, think, I think we've concluded that actually we do still need this somewhat for the AIL. Well, no, so generating the stub, the generating the ULA is one section because there's only one ULA. How we oh, use it. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Generating ULA for prefix. Using the ULA for a Okay, maybe just a comment on that. So I think we, we might have two, right? So two ULA prefixes. That is editing, so he, he can't hear me. <laughs> yeah, I guess. So I don't get that part about one ULA prefix, actually. There, there are so, two. Uh... Okay, so, so um, 
That, yeah, that's actually a good point. There, we're, uh, we're confusing terms here. So the ULA prefix is, when I say the ULA prefix, I mean the, the slash 48, right? So you can then generate prefixes from the slash 48. And those also are ULA prefixes, but, but here we're talking about, so yeah, slash 64 is you can generate out of the slash 48, but here we're talking about the slash 48. So um, maybe we should call the ULA, maybe we should call it the ULA site prefix. And then the other ones can just be ULA subnet. And, and what is that for the slash 48? What, what is it used for? The slash 48 is how big a, a ULA prefix is. You, you must generate a slash 48. You, you don't have a choice. Like that's what the spec says. So because okay. that those 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 forty I think it's forty is it forty bits yeah yeah, yeah. those forty bits um, provide enough randomness that a collision is unlikely we hope yeah but, but I'm just wondering so do you use that to advertise on the AIL or do you use that to advertise on the stub network so so think of this as a Swiss Army knife you use it for whatever you need it for. If you don't need it for advertising on the AL, you don't use it for advertising on the AL. Sure, sure. but um, what if you need two? So I need one for the AIL. I need to advertise it based on the thread uh, random ID. Right. So it, it, it prescribes all the bits basically, so you yeah. don't have much of a choice. So you <laughs> take that. And on the stuff network side, you can generate a second one that, that has complete freedom. Uh, so, so Again. you're 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 drawing a distinction that I think is is slightly unhelpful. There are actually just two different use cases. So, use case number one is we need a, a stub router specific slash forty eight ULA prefix. Use case number two is if possible, we would like a stub network specific slash forty eight. Right. So this is actually the questions you're asking are super useful for clarifying this. Uh, and I yeah, yeah. So, but there are two uh, at least. Well, in any case, uh, there, there may yeah. only be one, right? Because sometimes we don't have the ability to generate a stub network specific ULA prefix. But 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 this 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 uh, taxonomy is actually super useful. So thanks for taking so, it. Do you want to take some time before we Wait. just go to the next one? Or Lorenzo, do you have something to add to that specifically? Yeah, to this specific one. So I mean, like a stub must always have its own ULA 48, right? Must. Stub must always have its stub own. What? A stub reader must always have its yeah. own ULA48, right? Um, and if it yeah. if, if there's a technology that's like tunnels between multiple partitions, there's still just one stub reader, right? It's got to have its 48. We don't have to generate another ULA48 for the AL, do we? No. We basically whichever stub reader we elect. Uh, so so right, it could go one of two ways. Like either there's a way to generate a ULA based on the stub network information, like we do with Thread, or there isn't. If there isn't, then we basically do the same thing on the AAL that we do on the stub network. If there is, then there's a benefit to just using the same prefix all the time on the AIL. Wait a minute. Every stub must always generate its own 48, right? Yes. So then whichever stub we elect will can, can peel off one of the 64s in that 48 and, that, and can use that for the AIL. Right, but the, the, the issue here is not cons conservation of addresses. <laughs> no, but... It, <laughs> like having a third ULA to manage becomes very, like even more complicated, right? I don't, I don't know that it's actually complicated. I mean, our experience was that it made things a lot simpler when we made this change because now we, now all of the stub routers are advertising the same prefix on the stub on, on the AIL. Like any one of them will advertise, it, it, whichever one of them needs to advertise you that prefix. You can still have all the stubs advertise the same prefix, even if it was generated by one of the stubs, right? Well, or now not. we have to have the stubs collaborate. Yeah. Right. Well, they do have to go. Oh, okay. They don't. That's the thing. Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna just take a few minutes and let Ted catch up on the okay, editing I'll side of this, and we'll just questions. So we'll just, just pause for pause for three or four minutes here, and however long it takes for him to get his typing in. Yeah, I think what I'm hearing from all of this discussion is that we we, we need to talk about the two use cases separately. You know, and make that clear in the document. Okay. 
if people have uh, paper notepads to write their questions on and thoughts as they're sitting there, <laughs> please feel free. So I'm going to need to add uh, definitions for the terminology that I've called out above here to the glossary. This is actually text that belongs in a different section, but it's okay. Yeah. You can uh, hang the lips. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the important thing now is just get something down on paper and it can be moved after. So there's your privacy thing. So I think this clarifies the section. Um, I don't know if folks agree with that. I think for this, just as a, a chair note, um, we've, we're at the close of our time on this one, but folks uh, at the mic, go ahead and uh, go ahead and put in your comment. We have some text. I have just a very quick, uh, this, the last Which sentence one? contradicts oh. the rest. Which one's and that? And I would just change it to make the contradiction explicit. A closer. The last, the last sentence, I would say something oh, like, the for privacy however, reasons. if for privacy reasons it is desired, then to make the contradiction between what you, you say earlier and what you say in the last sentence explicit. However, if for privacy reasons it is required to blah, blah, blah. So then I, would, I would take out the if, but otherwise I agree with you. Sure. <laughs> it's the however that I...
next. And we could change may wish, may wish to uh, should, except that then we're going to have to say accept, and I'm not sure what the accept is. <laughs> Uh, some magic. Oh, I, actually, how about unless configured to behave otherwise? So, Tim Chan, a point of clarification then, Ted. So, in the in the infrastructure network, say the home network, is that if it's only got globals and the stub network appears, would there then be ULAs advertised into the home network from the stub route? No, global prefix is, is considered um, suitable. <laughs> Usable. Suitable, suitable. <laughs> but Let's not argue that again. So the question then is, from in the address, the 724 update, we have words like ULH, GUA is probably a misconfiguration. In this case, it wouldn't be if something at the stock uh, network is talking to the, something on the home network. So... Uh, this is an interesting point. Um, however, uh, this shouldn't actually be an issue. It, it, in a sense, you're right. It is a misconfiguration because that network shouldn't exist. If it's got a GUA, it should have a ULA. That's what the that's what 7084 says, right? Like this is not optional. This is required. So anyone, any residential ISP should be providing ULAs. Yeah. Now it's possible it that be, they sorry. won't be. No, no. The ISP doesn't have to provide the ULA. The router provides the ULA. Yeah. Now, but as I see, get your right router from your ISP. I'm not in love with that, but I agree with you that Unless that seems, seems to be the case. Other vendor, I guess. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, the point is that that the, that your stub router should, uh, or sorry, your your home router should be complying with RFC 7084, so it should be publishing a ULA prefix. If it's not, you're right that we're going to be talking uh, ULA to GUA, and um, I guess. The question I would have is, is the text that says that it's a misconfiguration saying, so don't do it, or is it just saying it might not work? I, I think this was, yeah, that text was written without considering this case, but at least in this case, you don't have the V4 precedence with ULA issue because there's no V4 in a snack network, right? Right. Just V6. Uh, on, on, on the stub network side. Stub yeah. network, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so, so this is a good point. We should make sure, uh, is, is, is that a document you're working on or that Tim's working on, or both? I'm just thinking about 6724 update, but it's actually having been clear in my head right. what the model of addressing is here. Oops. <laughs> yeah, it, elsewhere in this document, does it, or is there an arch, a snack architecture thing that says the sort of model of addressing that you would expect to see when a stub network appears on a home network? Uh, so, so, I mean, Julius actually kind of articulated this pretty well that we can't assume anything in particular about the home network. And if there's a, if there's a misconfiguration on the home network, A, we should do, maybe do something to work around it, but B, we should also try to get them to fix it. So um, the question is, um, is this something that happens and what would happen if it did happen? So for example, let's, let's say there's a host on the stub network. Um, and the host on the stub network is trying to communicate to a host that's on the adjacent infrastructure link. Mm. And there's only a GUA on the adjacent mm. infrastructure link, but PD isn't working. So we don't have a GUA on the stub network. Yeah. Um, in that case, uh, what's, what's the device on the stub network going to do? Is the source address selection process gonna, going to, going, and I should say the source and destination address, is that going to well, work or is it just going to fail? Well, candidate pair, the ULA GUA, it won't get... You might not get anything else. Well, right. So, so if if it produces the ULA and the GUA, then that's fine it will because it'll that. work, yeah. right? Like it is nominally a misconfiguration, but as long as the host doesn't like look at that and say, "Well, this is invalid," I'm just going to say the host is unreachable. Then we're okay. If it mm -hmm. looks at it and says this is invalid, the host is unreachable, then we're in trouble. So yeah, if you get, if forget if you forget the residential one where 7084 says you say it's a campus network, there's yep. no re requirement for campuses to run ULAs. So if you bring your stub thing onto campus you're going to have that yeah yeah no i mean i think i think that it's reasonable to suggest that we are going to see this in practice the question is whether it would actually cause an operational problem and i think the answer is no yeah. so then we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> okay yes yeah, so i think we're on to the next question 
So this is, uh, we just did four? Yep. So we're on okay. number five, uh, learning the RA header parameters. Oh, yeah, this oh, one. This is a big one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So somebody actually went up to the mic. Um, I don't know if it was in six man or V6 op. And I think, I think it might have been Jen. I'm not sure. And said that, or maybe it was Lorenzo, and said that the uh, the bits in the RA are okay. Lorenzo, yeah. Sorry, you guys look so similar that I, I confuse you a lot. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is clear, and it is very clear, guys. And. The very clear thing that is written is that the host will believe the most recently announced flag. And that is just it. This is how it works. Right. Um, I, so, I hope that's not up for debate. Okay. What might be up for debate is whether this means that the stub uh should copy the flag from the most recent RA. In my opinion, yes, because otherwise it's jerking around like the stuff, the other right. stuff that's on the yeah. network. But you know, like we we could discuss that. What I don't think can be disputed is what the RFC says. Okay, what they already published RFC. Says. So that's fine. Um, that means that we just have to do this, which is okay. I, I I don't have a problem with that. I would agree, but there was a lot of discussion. I just don't want to dispute what the RFC says because, like we, <laughs> because that's already written down. Yeah. No, no, I think we should assume that the RFC means what it says and that, that some hosts will do what the RFC tells them to do, possibly all hosts. And therefore, we need to uh, not screw over those hosts by I, confusing them. I also do want to provide the factual evidence that uh, all Linux hosts will follow the RFC and they will change their mind about the most recent O flag and M flag. Okay. I also think that should be a fact. Um, and then, yeah, we can debate stuff that's not facts, but... right. Yeah, and also here, uh, make it explicit. I think that these, uh, when these bits are copied from router advertisements, that they don't take uh, stub router advertisements as the source of truth, because if they have the stub uh, router uh, flag set, then, then you know they're just copying as well. So it's better uh, not, not to copy from those. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so indeed, um, I think we can... So I think I think what you're saying is that that we need to have text that says what to do when we don't discover any RAs on link other than stub router RAs. Yeah, that's also and one point. So in yeah. other words, what those flag, what the values for those flags should be in that case, and then right. what the values for those flags should be in the case that we do discover advertisements on link, and probably also what to do if we discover conflicting advertisements on link. Yeah, that's another case. I think that could yeah. happen. Yeah, and then you take the most recent, probably. That would be my guess. Uh, yeah, if non, we... non-stop router. Yeah, I think I think if it's a if that is considered to be a misconfiguration, which I would say it is, then um, we don't actually we're not really obliged to do anything about it because it's not our fault. So we could literally just take the bits from the last RA that we saw and copy those. And so that would mean that we would actually potentially be oscillating as well. But that's, again, not because we did anything. It's just because yeah, we're that's copying the, way it is, the yeah. network configuration. Right, yeah. That is correct. OK, so now the question is, do we have a section where we can put this? I do think that if there is a stub bit in the RA, which we sort of like also trying to define, then not copying for something that has the stub but yeah, it's sorry. useful, yeah. I, I, I apologize. I, I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't state that in my list of cases, but but yeah, we should just ignore any advertisements we see from stub routers for making this determination. And and the other point you mentioned, like do we have a section for that? Uh, I think there was another uh, open point coming from mailing list discussion is that uh, we would somebody said, Well, we would like to see a complete list of all the elements in the RA. Uh, and a complete list of how we set it and also why we set it yeah. that way. So that would right. be a new section probably. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's, yeah. We should just have a section that is constructing RAs. Yeah, so um, that you get and, kind of a complete R RA for dummies uh, over <laughs> Yeah, and, and also uh, there's probably a section on constructing RAs and then possibly either we have subsections for AIL and stub or we just have two sections, one for AIL and one for stub if they're so different that we can't. 
join them together. Um, cause I, I think on the stub network, we pretty much never want to set the M bit and we pretty much never want to set the O bit because we're not actually specifying that the stub router knows how to do DHCP and that's what those bits signify. Yeah. And then maybe for the, for that part for stub network, it's also technology dependent because threads uh, doesn't have any arrays, uh, for example, and it's right. other ways to do that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Wi-Fi uh, probably has the RAs. Right. So, I mean, we need to we need to specify how to do RAs for networks that use it. And for networks that don't use it, I think we can just say they are responsible for figuring this out and here's what they need to accomplish. So, um, I think we have good notes here. I'm a little tempted to say this is probably more work than you want to watch me do. So maybe we should maybe we should table this one and I'll get back to it after the meeting. Or, you know, either Jonathan or I, I guess we'll get back to it after the meeting. I don't want yeah. to put any demands on you though, Jonathan. So but no, no. If you, yeah. If and you if you feel like writing this, and we should just decide who's gonna write it and one of us write it. Yeah. Yeah. We we can talk about that offline. Great. Okay, clarify text as needed. Yeah, it's uh, the same text we were just a, editing. A participant question. Will it have any impact, impact on the state machines when we start processing these RAs with new flag bits? So I don't think, do we write a state machine for, for RAs? We don't have one. Well, right? We have a state machine for whether or not it's advertising a uh, prefix. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, if we certainly if we write a state machine for doing RAs, then it would have to uh, it would have to just it would have to include this information. But since we don't currently have one, then the question is, when we add the section, yeah. does the section just write, just describe the state machine or does it just do text? And I, I think we should look at what we write and see if it looks like it's going to be more or less confusing because the problem with state machines is, is that sometimes they are much clearer um you know like like if you don't do the state machine then it's not really clear what to do other times uh there are a lot of work to read and you have to form a mental model of what you're going to do and if you're not actually going to implement the state machine as a state machine you're doing a lot of extra work so we need to just like probably write it in text and then say well what would this look like if we wrote it as a state machine and would that be better so stub router must allocate a single ULA prefix. And by the way, I'm just saying that for, as my own opinion, if somebody else thinks that we should always do state machines, I'm certainly open to hearing that argument. Yeah, so, so this was indeed the part we just discussed uh, that has the words in it as needed. So, uh, so it was not from that text alone, it was not clear at all what, what it should do. Uh, I think we added now, or Ted added now already a lot of text there, so that's good. I think if if we have a section something like a uh, state machine or whatever that describes this in detail, then we should maybe uh, later on add a forward pointer to here. So, but this was exactly what we discussed before. So that it's like, okay, when do you, for example, allocate a prefix on the AIL? When not, etc. Yeah. Um, so it could be that it's already fixed or that we just need to add a pointer to uh, the protocol details for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, what we could do now is just uh, skip it, uh, wait for the next version of the text, and then we can uh, see if this is sufficiently clear already, because it's also open as a GitHub issue. So we can keep it open until, uh, until yeah, consider it to be clear enough. Yeah, so uh, right now um, we have sections 5.3 and 5.4 that talk about managing reachability on the stub network. And each of them is, well, actually, so uh, so managing reachability on the adjacent infrastructure link and managing reachability on the stub network. The adjacent infrastructure link section is two paragraphs and the stub router link is uh, like five paragraphs. Um, so uh, I think that we need to update these sections to account for what you're talking about. And so I think that that, that actually folds into the previous task because I suspect that this is, yep. you know, we have to write the section. Was that what you already said? Sorry, I was. Yeah, yeah. 
problem is I was I was scanning the document and trying to listen at the same time, <laughs> which is very difficult. There, yeah. <laughs> so okay, so I think I think that uh, six is going to be is going to be needs to be the task number six needs to be part of task number five. Yeah, the other can merge it. But yeah. I can check later on if, if the new text will does satisfy the <laughs> confusion. Yeah. So I think in terms of process, so uh, Jonathan uh, and Ted will probably make an update then, and I think we can also have, if anything needs to be added, to use the, the GitHub, GitHub PRs uh, as well to, to contribute new things. And if you want to propose text yourself, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's... I can now edit it as well. Right. I, I added a few question marks there where, where I changed things that are not 100% not clear if that's correct so you might want to scan for question marks i think um it would be helpful if people who are not uh collaborating directly with jonathan and me want to edit this text it seems like we we have a document here that we can do further edits on and then extract at some point um if you want to make some edits just like put your name in brackets like we've been doing in the notes and say what text you want to add just yep. like type in the text in context and then maybe bracket slash your name to end them. Yeah. And that way we can see who made the change. Cause I don't think that this does change tracking. Does yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that way we can, we can then, if, if, if there's a question, we know who to, who to discuss it with and we can just discuss yep. it on the mailing list. Okay. So uh, by the way, looking at section seven, it looks like it's got the same answer as section six or <laughs> item six, which is, this is part of uh, how we talk we, when we write the section about, uh, um, default routes, we need to, or, or sorry, about about generating RAs, we need to specify this. I, I thought we'd already said that, but that's, you know, apparently not. Um, so clarify yeah, snack. That, that, that seven goes to the detailed, you could say the RA details, and then you can automatically add that one in. Yeah. Seven will be a new section on RA. So I don't actually, um, I've, I've never actually seen this taxonomy before, um, which is perhaps an embarrassing admission, but here it is. Um, so, uh, okay, so RFC 4191 talks about the three host types. Um, can, can we talk about that briefly here? Like what's the yeah. issue here? Well, do you want to see 4191? Uh, um, I mean, yeah, we can bring it up. Yeah, it's worthwhile to just browse that if you haven't seen that before. Jonathan, can you share 4191? Summary, if your host is uh, before 2000 and whatever, then it doesn't work. I don't think I've ever seen a type A or B host. No sort of like current implementation is like that. Um, I'm not sure if they, if they even exist anymore because commercial hosts I either don't implement IPv6, like stuff that we're likely to find in home networks, either doesn't do IPv6 at all, or it does it as type C because like none of the none of the popular implementation or anything other than type C, I think so this is sort of like an early 2000s thing. I mean, like it basically it's a host without a routing table. It's just like it doesn't exist, I think. Right. Not anymore. Um, so uh, I think it's possible that uh, there could be IOT devices that wind up being fitting one of these two uh, types. Uh, certainly thread devices don't because they don't use RAs at all. Um, it's only for the AIL devices that this is discussion right. is relevant. Yeah. So I think, I think though, um, I mean, for AIL devices, uh, I mean, I guess they could be if, so yeah, if, 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 if they're, I can, I think of an AIL device as a type A or a type B host, then it's just not going to work unless you have a uh, prefix delegation. Yeah, so because like a type a type A or B host won't support RIO can't support RIOs, right? Right. So yeah. So basically, I think type A and B hosts just can't talk to to stub routers. And uh, you know, the thing is, like, so <laughs> this is a little bit like you know a little bit more of the bull in the china shop thing. But um, you know, like Matter is taking the thread stuff, and um, 
and incorporating it into their specifications. And so people are making matter devices that sit on home network, basically on the AIL as opposed to on the thread network, which would be the stub network. And those hosts, if they need to be able to communicate with hosts on the thread network, right now, if they were a type A or a type B host, that would just fail. Yeah. So I think if we have the power to make that statement here, like, you're like look, if I you feel like we do. Stack, yeah, you must, you must be a Type C host. Yeah, I feel like but, we. But in general, like you must be a Type C host. I mean, it's just. Uh, I, I mean, I, I wish, you know, if it wasn't a bunch of work to do it, like this text should be like you know burned to the ground. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's not useful anymore. Right. It's harmful, right? Because we can't do this interesting stuff. Yeah. So, but yeah, updating four one nine one. Sounds like a plan. Uh, if I understand correctly, the failure mode here is quite acceptable. So mm -hmm. if you have a light bulb on your AIL that cannot speak to a light bulb on the uh, stub network, I think that's acceptable for the user. Okay, it's not yeah. like the network is going to collapse because you connected the type B host at the wrong place. Right, yeah, I mean, the failure mode here is that you actually, the, the real world failure mode is that you have like a, a matter light switch that's connected, to, you know, it's, it's got power mains, it's connected to Wi-Fi and it's trying to talk to a thread device, but it's a type A host. So that just seems like, you know, if somebody did something like that, they would have shot themselves in the foot and they would notice it immediately when they found that they couldn't operate the, the, the light bulb and so they would fix it. Well, maybe I added a comment that, that what the type A host would do is would send the packet to the default router, which is your home router. Yeah. There. And maybe that home router would be smart enough to kind of Definitely Delegate not. It back. No, because the home router is required by the specification not to listen to RA, to RAs. So it has no idea okay. that there's a route to that network. So it's going to drop it on the floor or else it's going to send it, it upstream. Okay. okay, but then it's good, at least good idea as long as this type ABC is still uh, yeah. there to, to just say, hey, this is for type C. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think that we should say that, that uh, type A and type B hosts are unsupported for thread networks and explain why, or sorry, for stub networks and explain why, sorry, explain why we uh, don't think that's an issue. Yep, and that's, that's related to the previous issue of specifying that stub router shall never advertise a default route on the AL. Yeah. Yeah, because that, be, that would be very damaging if they did that. There's a lot of things that would go wrong. I'm just going to go look and see if that makes sense in section 5.3. Uh, one, one thing maybe not related to, not maybe doesn't belong in this particular section, but um, you know, if, if the if the AL supports RA guard, um, the whole thing is doomed unless unless prefix delegation is in use, which is right. you know, reasonable. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we want to say that. Probably should. So yeah, so I mean, the the RA guard case um, probably works if prefix delegation is enabled on the network, and if I think it's not, we should try to do better than probably. Uh, I think we can though. It it should work, right? Yeah. No. We well. Let's see. Uh, yeah, it should work because because the infrastructure gave us the the prefix, right. delegated us the prefix, and so it's going to have the right route. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. That should work. Um, then yeah. yeah, we just need to say, well, if you if you if you intend to head to pull your RA guard in your or because you have security properties that you want to provide, um, snack won't work unless you know prefix navigation is enabled. Yeah, and we might want to well, we might want to say like you know, well, we don't recommend the prefix navigation be enabled, but if not, you know, we can just say well, it, it won't work otherwise. Yeah, and some set of networks will you know. It's it's moderately likely that a network that implements RA guard, RA guard probably won't want random stuff to appear like this. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean this is this is pretty much the exact use yeah. case that that Ulu was talking about yeah. on the mailing list a while back. Yeah, if they if they want to do this, there's a supported path for them, and just like yeah. implement PD, right? Right. Um, if you just don't want Snack to work at all, yeah, just turn on RA guard and don't don't listen to PD. And um, I'm. Is there anything more we need to say here, I wonder? You know, I think if you do PD, then it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing to say about RA guard is that um, there was a discussion about whether all routers should have RA guard turned on. Um, and uh, this was a couple of years ago. And I participated in that discussion. I believe the conclusion at the end of the discussion was 
RA guard must be explicitly enabled. It can't be, it can't just happen automatically because if it does, it's going to cause dysfunction. So. Lucky that it requires work to enable it and work to code it because otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think the, yeah, the, the answer for this one, ironically, is that it's probably going in the same discussion as well. So yeah, it's probably going in the same discussion with the other RA stuff. Um, yeah. Make all contents, that's the same discussion. Yeah. Uh, more details on prefix delegation, renew, rebind, and AIL change situations. Mm. So, item nine? yeah, no, this is item 10. Basically, everything up to item 10 was uh, more grist for the RA or for the router advertisement section. So, um, finds a mandatory client role for the stub router. There are no details about what should tr trigger. Well, that's in the protocol specification. Yeah, I think think one one thing was that um, there is some re requirements. Uh, so we should point maybe to uh, the protocol specification that would be helpful. But when I read the protocol specification, it was not yeah not super clear uh, what are exactly the conditions for uh, mm -hmm. doing this. Renew or rebind. I never know which one, so I, <laughs> I often call them both. Yeah. So, so what are the change situations? So there are one one case is uh, a bit better explained in the RFC, but but not in general. It just says, oh, when there's significant change, whatever that may be, then uh, the device must do X. So, but what is for a stop router? What does it mean? Does it does it change? reference DNA detecting network attachment? Sorry. Does it reference the, the DNA RFC detecting network attachment? No, I've never heard about that. Okay. One, so, so, so this, so. this feels like it's something that should be there. There's an effort going on right now to, uh, to bring RFC 8415 to standard status. And so if there are things like this that are missing from 8415, what I would, what I would suggest is that rather than addressing them by making requirements in this document, I think that's out of scope for this document. What should happen is that uh, you should bring your, your questions to the DHC working group and say, dudes, this is not clear enough. We need to clarify it. Or, yeah, so you so know. you're saying it's general uh, PD clients must uh, monitor the network, basically. Yeah, like yeah, that's the yeah, requirement, I mean, then it should be clear what, what to monitor for. Right. And if it's not clear, when you read RFC 8415, if it's not clear to you how to implement it or what to do, that's a bug in 8415, which is worth fixing and which is in the process of being fixed. So, so let's fix it and get it, get 8415 bis right rather than, you know, cause otherwise you, you have like little corrections like this scattered throughout random RFCs and it becomes very difficult. Like, like we solve the problem for us, but yeah. we don't solve it for anyone else. Oh, well, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. So it is me. We have, so <clears throat> the, uh, there's a draft in six man, which is, currently in the adoption call, uh, which is about uh, the the P flag in the PIO, which uh, would trigger a DHP prefix delegation. There is text in there about like what you would do. So for example, it says, you know, like watch, watch the set of prefixes that are currently advertised with the P flag on them. And, and if they change, do something. Um, I don't think we can do that here though, because I assume that a stub router would just like under unconditionally require, um, prefix delegation, right? They wouldn't look at the P flag. They would just say, I want a prefix, right? Yeah. Because, uh, in particular, because if w when there's a network with RA guard, that's a failure mode where the router just doesn't work, it doesn't even know that it can't work, right? So there's, so it were prop. So, so I would assume, do we say that we want to ask for PD all the time if we're a stub router? Because it, it's strictly better, right? Then, or do we not say? I, I do agree, by the way, that we should sort of ask DHC to clarify these things. Yeah. So what it says is, and this is this may actually need some wordsmithing now that I read it. It says that if IPv6 prefix delegation and IPv6 service is, probably should be R, both available on the infrastructure. And there's link, no way to know that. 
PD, you don't know. You, you have to well, ask. So, so the the uh, the M bit uh, in in RC eighty four fifteen, the M bit is supposed to. When you see the M bit, you're supposed to try PD if you want it. No, M is explicitly about addresses. That if, if there's any agreement on what it means. Oh, sorry, not the M bit, the O bit. The O is like other configuration information. Right, which includes sure. prefix delegations. You can think that, yes. Um, there can be very well. So, so, things. so remember, I used to be the chair of, of of the of the working group, and it was our understanding that the O bit included prefix delegation. That I, doesn't mean I, that anybody it, else understands. If it that. was your understanding, you should have <laughs> written it down more clearly than you did. We weren't allowed to. Not that I'm bitter. <laughs> and there you are. That was that. that then, then there was understanding, but not shared understanding. Yes. Yes. No, I actually want to say just a uh, comment about if something is unclear on 8415. I think the last call finishes on 20th of November. So it's like a week from now. Oh. So it, it's what my understanding Thank you from for the telling us session. That. Yeah. So uh, if anyone wants to fix anything, it's probably like ex exactly the right time to do this. It's not like wait for like two months. Right. Esco, how do you feel about doing this? Yeah, I can take a look. Yes, definitely. Awesome. Thank you. In, in general, I think it, so 8415 is, well, yes, hard to understand, but also very um, unidirectional as it were. It's like, well, the server tells you to do this, you know, figure it out because the server has told you to do this and you've got to do it. But well, you know, it's very sort of, it's got lots of degrees of freedom and so on, you know, like you got multiple IAs and things. I think, though, the, the significant change kind of really boils down to if you if you roam to a new access point or you move to a new network, really. That is kind of what it means, I think. Asking asking them to clarify would be a good idea because, like, I suspect no one knows the answer to that question, right? And so it, it, the DT will chase its tails for a while on that because if we, do, we don't know. And, it, it, and it, they should we should write it down in 8450. Right. Yeah, I mean, it sounds to me like the document is not ready for last call. <laughs> Yeah. So I, all you need to do is 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 put that um, you know, is is uh, employ that delaying tactic in the last call for eighty four fifteen and say, look, you know, we need to figure out all of this stuff. Sorry, which is a reasonable assertion, especially if what it needs to be done is is promote full standard, right? You can't have like random random uninitialized you know like behavior if you promote right. it to full standard. So you basically yeah. go in and say, hey. Um, we need to figure this out. In particular, we're a customer for this. Like, Snack's a customer. We need to. It needs to be like more fleshed out. Okay. And yeah, and that you know, will, that's a reasonable thing to say in the last call before it terminates. As, as right. Yeah. Okay. So, Esco, are you willing to drop that hammer, or do you want me to do it? <laughs> now I can uh, <laughs> start. <laughs> okay. All right. I will. I will. Uh, I'm on the mailing list. I tend to ignore it, but I will pay attention now. Okay. <laughs> um, and. Uh, uh, forgive me for asking me which Eric is responsible for. <laughs> okay, all right. So, you, so you, you've heard this discussion. Yeah. Okay. My condolences. All right. So, uh, issue eleven. Oh, the PD per device. Uh, that sounds like a useful work item. I don't think it's something that we can actually do here. Um, well, we can collect some ideas uh, in the room if there are any. Uh, well, so we've got the we've got the down. authors in the room. So what do yeah, the authors think about why. this? <laughs> oh, I see. There's some there's some bullet items. Uh, the authors do solemnly swear that any host behavior is out of scope for this draft. <laughs> So that's what it what that's what it says. So you know, if mm -hmm. if you wanted anything about host behavior, then you if you wanted to put it in this draft, we would tell you that it's not a, that it's out of scope. Okay. Uh, which means, I think that the answer might just be no. There is nothing. I mean, that this is, and 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 this is really intended to tell the network, here's how you do PD in a way that it will work, right? Right. I think, yeah, the, the bit about telling home home routers, uh, I'm assuming that, that that's what this reference to Section 11 is talking about, the telling home routers like that they have to actually put a route in the routing table. We deleted any and all text or, or uh, no? Go ahead. No, like uh, this might be the Section 11 consideration. Uh, 
No, like, it's like I think what the, our draft might be useful because you might get more networks which will give you PD. Right, that's a clear benefit, right? It, which it does say. I mean, I think so. I am, section nine, where it uh, says like nine. client mobility, uh, where it says, well, if a client moves, of course it will ask again, and of course I, we'll give it something different. Yeah, yeah. Like the design proposed in our draft definitely says you. The the, des, the deployment model suggests that you get in a new prefix, right? Theoretically, you could get the same, but that would require changes to PD relay specification because it me because PD relay RFC requirements explicitly say that you have to keep the route pointing to link local address of the client, even if the client, if the neighbor unreachability detection tells you that link local is not here anymore in case it comes back, which means if you had an old route and you keep, keep the same prefix and you move to another VLAN or whatever in the network, right? You will have two routes pointing to like conflicting routes and you'll get packet loss, right? So if you want to have a, a prefix mobility, we would need to change this. And it was definitely like, so that's why we like limiting it. Like I, think, another one. I think that the text here is useful to to feed into the the, the, the discussions in a, how how do we change eighty four fifteen to say okay like if you move to a new link you should probably do rebind right because eighty four fifteen is I mean re realistically eighty four fifteen you know like the DGC group did a lot of work to make PD sort of like up to you know like to, to make it a first class citizen as it were um, but you know home gateways don't move so they they didn't think about that right so I think having having this text be the springboard for something that we want to change in, in, in 84.15 is, is useful. Again, host behavior is out of scope here. We do have the one in six man that is where it would be in scope, but that one is about the P draft, which we're not going to probably yeah. not going to implement here. So, and yeah, running out of PD prefixes, I don't think the draft is like section 11 here, right? You know, running out of PD prefixes here is kind of not, um, not really sort of, relevant right if we don't get a prefix then we do fall back right like if we're asked for pd and it's not there there's no we can't really tell the difference between pd is not available and you know pd ran out of prefixes right so right. i guess we would say let's not try to ask for too many prefixes at the same time because that will sort of exhaust the pool and and also the p draft the intent of the p draft by the way is that it be disabled on home networks and so if we want to use PD and home networks, we need to ask anyway, even if the PD bit is zero, the P bit is zero. So, yeah, I mean, there, the other the other challenge with PD is that if you've got multiple stub routers, obviously each one of them has a different identity, and so it's going to get a different prefix. And we don't want them all to have prefixes; we want only one prefix. Well, um, not if they're behind you. Right? Well, no, yeah, yeah, of course, but yeah. but in the case that the stub network is the same, we don't want multiple prefixes, so, and so that creates a potential for thrash. So I have a I have a thought about that. Um, ask for a prefix with a relatively short. I can't ask for a short lifetime. My lifetime is specified for me, right? It's DHCP, the server tells you. The server you tells ask. you, so we don't allow. Yeah, so I'm going to say I could. We, one could ask. One could ask for a, sh a, a short lifetime, and then if it turns out that someone else has a, a prefix, you could give it back. But you could do a release. You could do a release. So, so you could do a release if if it turns out that you didn't need one after all. Yeah. Um, and that actually might be the the right thing is actually just just to well, yeah. So yeah, I mean, actually, this, uh, but, this is. But this... I was gonna. But I actually go stood up to say, uh, Lorenzo, eighty four fifteen will go into. Uh, working group last call. Bis, yeah. sometime you said that. Yeah, we said that. Jen, we, Jen said that. Yeah. It's like, uh, 8415 last call, as far, as far as I can remember, I might be wrong, ends on the 20th of November. Right, right, right. So, so all I'm saying is that that what, what you just said about about um, uh, getting a new prefix in a new place sounds like a one sentence uh, yeah, 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 working group last call yeah, yeah. statement. Yeah. So, well, so, ESCO, and that's on ESCO. So and ESCO, about, yeah. So I think that that's good. Um, I like to forget stuff, but we said get it in a I like to know that I can safely it's called, forget it's it. It's called outsourcing. Right. <laughs> it's called outsourcing. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, so, so yeah. Yeah. There's one other thing, which I think, um, given that we, so, so 
saying like we're not we're going to release a prefix you know correct though it may be is going to be uh, quite fun with like when we have these like uh random CPEs implementing PD. Um, now, Tim, of course, does have a draft in v6ops right now. Well, he doesn't because we keep failing to adopt it for whatever reason. I don't know. We, we really need to ping she Peng about that. But anyway, so, so he has a draft which says, which describes how you, sh you can use PD on home networks. And his, his, what he's trying to do is get more routers to implement PD. So the nice thing about that is that not many implement PD, which means not many have buggy implementations of PD. <laughs> so what we could do is we could work with Tim on this and basically say, um, well, if you do PD, you must support releases because you're, you're, you have a limited set of clients and like they might sort of like release prefixes, so you must do it correctly. Right. So then once once this text appears in whatever 7084 bis maybe or, or or in RFPs or in the matter router certification or whatever, we can at least say, okay, like you must support releases. Um, so. so it's not getting adopted, okay. Yeah. There's no, I don't think anyone asked, right? Like we it's like it's not like a hard feature, it's like that's the chairs didn't ask for adoption. Okay, we need to fix that somehow. Yeah. So uh this, I just want to interject one thing into this discussion about release, which is that um, we, uh, we have the same problem with DHCP provided prefixes that we have with any other prefix that might change over time, which is that um, hosts might still have routing table entries and might still have addresses configured on that prefix because of the prefix lifetime that we advertise. So we need to make sure that we, keep, that we don't release the prefix until the valid lifetime that we advertised has expired. The, the prefix would never... But but the prefix would, the prefix is, I, I would argue that we would never, should never send an RA on the AAL with a prefix that we got. If we got a prefix, right. it's no, just I'm talking us. about I'm talking about on the stub network. So this is oh, the non-thread case. On the non, in the non-thread case where we have like a Wi-Fi network or whatever that's a stub network, then we need to make sure that the router advertisement yeah. that we advertise, uh, that we honor the, the valid lifetime of that router advertisement. And that may mean that when we first get a prefix delegation that we set um, maybe a relatively short preferred lifetime. Because I think if we set a really short valid lifetime, the device might just ignore it. Um, yeah. But that's what we should do. And then pump it up. Yeah. So I like the way we are moving back from digital to analog cues, by the way. <laughs> and we have only a couple of minutes. Yeah, I just that. wanted to to say that, okay, I think the, something about release is maybe good to mention in the draft. I don't think it's currently uh, mentioned. So the right. same as Lorenzo said, uh, yeah. maybe well, that yeah, also so make that explicit. In, uh, <laughs> it seems like we need to do a fair amount of additional text in order to describe the thing that I just mentioned. And, and that would include the release stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So... It's like a um, smart way of releasing, yeah. <laughs> Non-technical comment, could we um, get the matter folks to uh, recommend that home gateways did do PD? Yeah, oh, absolutely. In fact, I think we are, there, we're already doing that, aren't we? Do we? Yeah. Well, that's that's excellent. Good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of our goals with the with the matter home gateway work is to try and get all the stuff into the home gateways that we need in order to make the stuff work smoothly. So we should definitely work with Tim on that draft. Then we really need. Did any? Did, did, did people know which draft I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. yeah I thought it was a no brainer. Well, yeah. Can I you start just... a thread? And it's like, hey, can like you? We need this. Snack needs this. Yeah. yeah. Please. Um, yeah. Like, if you start a thread, I'll say like, look, you know, I'll. Yeah, okay, guys. So um, we have one minute left. Um, I was last just comment, Richard. I was gonna say um, uh, at this point, I think. That, correct me if I'm wrong, Ted. I think that someone can go implement with some oopses, maybe this document, um, and that might be worth saying. Um, and the the next step is it might be it might be interesting to have some fora to be able to do some kind of interop, which other than CSA matter. So Michael, did you just I mean, volunteer like the... to do that implementation? Is that right? God, I'd love to be telling you that, uh, but <laughs> but I, I'm not Sounded telling like you it. that. I would okay. really like to tell you that, but yeah. I'm not. So um, I think that's right. And it might be fun to do a hackathon thing if anybody's interested in doing that in, uh, in Brisbane. Yeah, in because yeah, nobody will be yeah, there or what? <laughs> Ted, Ted, we were actually thinking calling some university students and see if they can read your draft and implement it. Yeah. 
Great. So, let's see how far that goes. Sounds good. Um, yeah, with that, um, we end this meeting. I hope it wasn't too bad. You guys were okay with the way we went about resolving like issues. Not a single and PowerPoint slide. No, very good. Yeah. So yeah. This was super great, useful. Like great, I would rather great. that the, more working group meetings were like a, this. Good feedback. So what we are going to do is just copy over issues and their comments as our meeting minutes notes. And that still has a lot of work to do till, net, till next ITF meeting. Thank but you. I think Darren, we have a much words. clearer idea of what that work is. Yeah, and a real big thank you to Ted and Jonathan and everybody here for your very uh, super collaborative. This is the most fun I've ever had in the IETF working group. So thank you. That's how it should be. Yay. Thank you, guys. We're done. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. It wasn't bad. That was just that was spectacular. It was so fun. And I love that they came out with the implementation at the last minute. Like <laughs> they did exactly what we wanted them to do. <laughs> I think the thing there is there that feeling that unless you implement it, yes, you don't from know the specification. how it's going to Especially RA handling for yeah.